Okay, so my name is Laurence, I'm from Laval University, Quebec, and the paper I'm presenting today is uh, pretty much in the line of uh, Katie and Just paper, like the, the basic idea is the same, but I took the route of trying to apply a case study to it and see what happened. Um, well, we'll see together. Um, so, like the, the thought happened uh, last winter when I stumbled upon an interview with Vag Wagner James Howe, who's a journalist who has been reporting on Second Life for now 20 years. Um, so for those who don't know or have forgotten, because it's very old, uh, Second Life is a metaverse platform where people can do and create pretty much whatever they wish, and most importantly, importantly, interact with others using their avatars. So Second Life is a community-led open universe, so it's constantly changing and expanding. Um, from his then 19 years of observation and reporting on Second Life, uh, Howe states that as humans, we take all of the big challenges of real life and the complex social structures of the physical world, and, and they get recreated in weird ways in a digital social space, which is, well, ringing a bell to archaeologists. Um, Howe uh, How stresses, however, that the metaverse experience is not about recreating a second space, what Facebook seems to want us to do in providing yet another space for other awkward online meetings. Um, for Ao and I agree, I agree, the virtual space is real enough. For example, uh, as he as exemplifies, uh, he says, when you watch people on Twitch playing Fortnite, they are blowing each other up and talking about politics, geopolitics, or issue in popular culture. So the vir virtual world experience is an interaction point, but it's tightly integrated to real life, as you exemplified. Um, so I tried to see if, like, outside of our own little world of archaeology, uh, this idea of embedded worlds, like, was, was a thing. And um, this idea of the internet as an immaterial yet real space um, embedded in that physical world uh, doesn't have a long history as far as I could see. Uh, the first full reflection on the topic I could find is uh, the one of French philosopher Paul Mathias uh, in his 2009 book, What is the Internet? And for him, the essence of the Internet is found in hybridization of people and machine, but not in a cyborg way, but more like, um, like relating to how discourse is constructed, structured, or shared. Um, so this idea of embeddedness uh, also appears um, like uh, in an internet manifesto, so really a reflection on the internet, uh, that's titled "What uh, We the Web Kids, and that was first published online, but like republished many times uh, by the Polish poet and essayist Piotr Czeski. Sorry for any Polish uh, person in the room. Um, and he writes, the internet to us is not something ex external to reality, but a part of it, an invisible yet constantly present layer intertwined with the physical world, uh, physical environment. We do, we do not use the internet. We live on the internet and along it. The web is a process happening continuously and continuously transforming before all, our eyes. And similar remarks have been made by early ethnographers and anthropologists of the web, uh, such as Tom Bolstorff. His work is kind of mind-blowing. Um, however, current discussion do not yet directly engage with the interplay and embeddedness of physical and virtual world in a wider context than one single community, uh, as anthropology has like really large con concerns with ethics and fieldwork field work methods on the internet, which we understand. Um, but there remains in all this reflection in anthropology that the quality, like the embedded quality and the reality of practices related to virt virtual worlds are not debated. They are in fact the postulates, like the beginning of this exploration. So on this, um, I was thinking that those observations are not exactly a surprise because many extraordinary cannot say this properly, extraordinary worlds uh, are blurring the lines between realities. Uh, those worlds have been around for much before the internet or video games. Um, we, we, we just touch on myths and folklores, folklores who tell us about those hidden worlds, uh, like the Kels Fairylands or the Great Hell. Um, like they are, there are many uh, worlds like that, and they usually affect the known world when, when humans seek something. Um, and to get that something, they need to communicate with those hidden worlds. And what is usually sought in those stories uh, or uh, from these worlds are often answers and wisdom, uh, a, fa a favor, or like, or the or people seek to fulfill a desire, a need or a desire. But what often happens as well is that in a communication with the hidden world, um, usually the person in communication need to ward against or fool malevolent entities who are coming in the way. 
Uh, whoa, sorry, that wasn't <laughs> my intent. Um, and what is most interesting to us archaeology uh, archaeologists is that we have the, the, there is a presence of physical proof of belief in uh, and of tentative com communication with hidden and extraordinary, extraordinary worlds. Um, and here are some examples just to set the table. Um, the thin lead band at the lower right, um, your left, uh, is a, a dodona tablet. So these bands were inscribed with questions to the gods and hung uh, in the sacred trees at the dodona sanctuary between the 2nd and 6th century BCE in Greece. Um, and the people who ask such, such questions as, should I undertake medical studies? Or like, sh um, what should Massimus do about his daughter's health? They made direct requests for wisdom and answer. Um, if you travel on your upper left, um, you have an offering, and that's the most common way to ask for small favors to other like external beings. Um, and the example here, uh, it's a rosary on the clothesline, and it's part of uh, French Canadian folklore, where in order to ensure, ensure good weather for wedding, uh, one must hang the rosary on the, the night prior on the clothesline. Um, but like this is an example, it's kind of half pagan, half Catholic, but this kind of intercession uh, is found in many other tra tradition, like both religious and profane. Um, a last example encompasses both um, warding against dark forces and fulfilling a need, and it's the Sotoshelir uh, cave in Iceland. Um, and the Viking settlers who settled there between uh, 1930 and 1020 AD um, believed that the demon, fire demon Soto, who is supposed to begin Ragnarok, it's kind of scary, um, uh, dwelled in the cave. So in order to keep the demon, the fire, the destruction, the lava <laughs> in the cave and feel they were having done something about it, uh, the Viking settlers performed sacrifices of pregnant you, uh, marine birds, and even Iranian glass pearls, uh, according to Kevin Smith and Veronique Maranger, who is to publish soon about this. Um, coming back to the internet, because that's kind of the topic, topic here, um, it appears that those types of interactions are also an important part of people motive for web interaction. So looking for answers is kind of the primary use of internet. Um, the, the wisdom part might be harder to combine, but well, that's the internet. Uh, asking for favor is also a common uh, on exchange groups and forums mostly, um, while fulfilling needs or desires being taken care of in all possible form on the internet. You just need to have the mean to acquire whatever you like. Um, and, uh, well, <laughs> the last part, uh, well, we all need to ward our online lives against trolls or anybody who is trying to intrude uh, on our computers. So the pearl does exist in like our motives to interact with internet, but also with other types of immaterial worlds. Um, so those sort of communication with, again, extraordinary worlds uh, are widely termed as ritual. Though archaeology wrestles with its manifestation in the material record for a very good reason that I'm not going to discuss here fully, uh, we do have clear definitions of the practices, though. Um, Chadwick provided one in his 2012 work where he writes that a ritual practice is the establishment of a link between the realm of everyday human life and an extraordinary world, that's his fault, I cannot read that, outside of the experience. Um, the definition brings focus on the contact and communication aspects of ritual, what you also mentioned, <laughs> um, which we tend to forget about very often because we don't have any material reality, material like um, proofs of those worlds that people were trying to establish contact with. Um, so usually when we can, it's because we have some oral tradition or some text. But when we have nothing out of this, uh, uh, nothing of this, what, what can we do as archaeologists? And that's where the comparison with communication behavior on the internet uh, could maybe be useful in our reflection as archaeologists. Um, maybe it's important here. Um, the thing is that our psychology of how we behave on the internet is not the same as how we behave with other people like in the real life. And interestingly, the branch of psychology that kind of answered that why is the branch that looks at belief. So we're in the communication, belief, and ritual. So it's kind of all linked, but through psychology, which was like a very, in, like, 
astonishing discovery for me. So I just took that path and here I'm presenting it to you. Um, so it's kind of an unfamiliar thing. So I'm really going to read this so you follow with me. <laughs> um, so apparently in belief psychology, the current working model suggests that fragmented systems with their own internal logic cohabit in one's mind. So how to act, how we take decisions in a given context appears to be framed by different fragments, therefore by different logics, which are, which are not necessarily completely disconnected from other sets of belief we have, but may be dissonant or even con contradictory, but we still live with that happily. <laughs> So, for example, someone can be commenting on the internet and maybe like racist, odious, like a very terrible person, but will never voice such comment in person in front of, of the same group of people with who they are talking on online. So, in short, humans respond to different sets of logic depending on the situation they're in. And archaeology cannot hope to assess such a state of mind, but if parallels can be drawn between internet and believed in world regarding communication and interaction, and if psychology already draws parallel between beliefs and, well, what happens to our minds uh, during our online activities, there might be something to it. So that's what I'm trying to apply um, to like an ethno ethnographic and slightly archaeological context, um, because this is all very speculative. Um, that context is the Canadian Arctic, where in recent years, uh, Inuit elders have opened up about uh, Enga Kunik or shamanistic practices, uh, practices which are also encountered in the archaeological record. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a little, little bit of context about uh, Inuit and Gakuit, which is the plural for shamans, um, and the general cosmological understanding in Inuit traditions, uh, which have a lot in common with other Arctic cultures if, you are, if some uh, of you are working up north in, in Europe. Uh, this informations are, uh, these informations are found in ethno ethnographic work, such as uh, Pentakayans, uh, but also in the work of current Inuit writers and communicators, such as uh, uh, Rachel atatuk Kitsualik, who's discussing that uh, like in columns and in her, uh, on her blog. Uh, she's quite vocal about that. Um, so for the Inuit, uh, the, like traditionally, uh, the world is separated in three tiers. That's kind of, that's a, like modern illustration, but it's still what it is. Um, so three tiers, the upper world is uh, like the sky and it's cold, there's no food, but it's populated by beings. So humans, animals, dead and alive, uh, and also Inuak, which are uh, spirits, which can be malevolent or helpful, depends. Um, there's the middle world where the Inuit live. So that's the, the world we know. And there is the underworld, which may be underground or underwater. And that tier is warm and welcoming and populated by basically the same thing as in the sky, but they just have a better living environment. Um, and the Angakok, so the singular for shaman, uh, in all of that is the specialist who can travel and communicate directly between the hidden world and the middle world. Um, and the Angakok specific functions may vary from a community to another, like Canada is really large and so is the Arctic. Um, but uh, what is shared by all uh, throughout the ethnographies is that the Angakrit uh, are not priests, they are not guardian of co cosmological knowledge, so they are not like the center of the community, though they are a, a really important part of it. Um, but what, like, where the, the subtlety is, is that the Ngakwit draw from traditions and, fol and folklore uh, to further their trade uh, that's related to those worlds. Um, in that large world system, all the spheres of life are connected. And for the Inuit, it is common knowledge that hidden world, uh, that the hidden world uh, is a place for experimentation and transgression, which can be both dangerous and full of opportunities when you interact with it. And that's the crux of it, because if you leave it alone, not much is going to happen. Like there are some specific cases when interaction can happen without like the connection through the, Enga, uh, the Enga cup, but mostly you need to interact with it for powers and, and transformation to happen. Um, and that's where the psychology comes back in. Um, so thus far in all that, that all those pieces that are brought to you, I posited that there are parallels between internet and extraordinary, extraordinary worlds regarding their perceived embedded nature, the motives to connect with those worlds, and like between the interactions uh, and the rationalities guiding those interactions. But what is more like interesting um, than those parallels uh, is the fact that the, the main psychological aspect associated to interacting with and on the internet also applies 
pretty much fully uh, to inaccurate uh, communication with hidden worlds. Um, so here is another psychologist who made the internet like his main field of study for a couple of years. Um, it's called Hamburger. Um, and he, he suggests that there are seven main characteristics framing human use and interaction with the internet. So three of them are like very much related to the communication aspect and the four, four others are concerned with the, the social aspect of internet interaction. So according to him, uh, those elements are like the, the communication elements are feeling of anonymity, disembodied interaction and the control over physical exposure uh, and the high control over communications. So when we look at inaccurate practices within that framework, um, the, the defining elements uh, are, are there. So the main type of recounted communication with the hidden world uh, by an Ngakok is through physical transformation and disembodiment, which allow the access to the hidden world. But it, it also acts as a protection for the Ngakok because um, it, it gives uh, the Ngakok some anonymity so the, the ghost can uh, like identify that person and follow them to the community and haunt them, which is like a really important fear uh, in Inuit traditions. Um, and for the high control over communication, um, that's also a big concern for the Angakot, Angakot uh, himself or herself, but it's also for all the members of the community. And that's where um, like everyone is involved and not only like the specialist, because uh, animals are, uh, are believed to understand Inuit so the, the Inuit speech. So um, if people are planning a hunt, well, you won't uh, like talk about the caribou and calling them caribou because they can hear and then they will change their plans and then the hunt won't work. So you call them like lemmings or foxes just to make sure that you mix everything and that you actually have something to eat. Um, if we look at the social aspect, uh, Hamburger talks about finding and fostering communities online. In Inuit traditions, uh, the Ngakok, as I said a bit earlier, is a very important figure in the community. And as reported by Atatuk Ketualik, that's pretty much why elders today are keener to discuss like the 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 Angak, uh, practices um, because they don't want to lose that. They want to share it so it, it lives, uh, and they don't want to 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 lose that part of the com of their community. So that's that's part of community forming, basically, um, and and of identifying as Inuits. Um, the internet is also okay. I'm really not done. <laughs> okay, um, it is also um, sorry. I lost my line. Um, yeah, uh, uh, like a place that never sleeps, and that's pretty much the same uh, with the hidden world. Like many things can can happen uh, while you're not communicating with it. And lastly, uh, Hamburger mentions that um, there's a fun aspect of navigating the internet, and that's also found uh, that we find in stories, whether we read them, watch them, uh, play at them. And the fun aspect of Venga Creek practices is not really in the practice, but it's found uh, in stories um, and all the tales that like 10 of them usually it's two Ngakwit like meeting and flexing their powers at each other and usually something funny uh, ends up happening out of this. Um, so yes, yeah, so there are like many uh, parallels we can um, we can bring like out of the psychology of interacting with an hidden world. Um, yeah, I'll go quicker. Um, but that's all ethnography. So as an archaeologist, I was wondering, what can we do with actual material that we have no, um, no stories to go with? And I looked at the Dorset carved objects, which have been interpreted as related to shamanistic uh, practices. But in fact, we don't know because there is no link between the, the Dorset people and the Inuit today, even though they occupy the same territory. Um, so I was wondering, like, is there any way we can make sense of this? Uh, using using those ideas of, of, of psychology and um, and well going through uh, quicker um, the idea the, the answer is that well the carved object existed millennia before the contact so we have basically no bridge between the Dorset people and the Tule or the actual an ancestor of the Inuit who populated the Arctic uh, right after the Dorset kind of fizzled out fizzled out um, but the thing is, they have a common Siberian origin, uh, which is supported by archaeology, ethnography, and some DNA. Um, so, so maybe, like that, that's a pretty, like that, that's a ground we can work with. But the issue with an ancient common origin is that it's an origin. So it's probably 
like evolved differently uh, over time and transformed and adapted to new contexts and new people and new interactions. Um, so we can we really cannot like copy paste in Whitmits to those objects. So we can maybe look at what's common all throughout the Arctic and and use a common base knowledge and apply it, um, and then look at these psychological interactions and maybe understand them better. But um, yeah, it's not exactly convincing. And it's getting even worse with the psychologist's idea of the frag fragmented mind model, because then like, we have multiple logics to make sense of in like different contexts of which we don't have all the information about. So yeah, it's not exactly conclusive. So I'll finish on that, uh, seeing that the internet and metaverses are admittedly disappointing in their archaeological results. Um, though the developing anthropology of the internet still holds prom promise promises uh, regarding the study of the interplay between online activities and their effect on the offline world, um, because that's something we reflect about as archaeologists. Um, but while we do that, we kind of need to prepare ourselves uh, in approaching the matter and and looking at the inevitable pitfalls, because this will be an ethnoarchaeology of internet. So with all the problems with ethnoarchaeology, we kind of need to reassess that. Uh, and uh, outside of future possibilities, uh, what this exploration about the psychology of internet interaction brought really the heuristic quality of reflection, because it really brought me like in other places, as you can witness. Um, and it also, like, the one thing that's interesting in it is that it brought, like, an emic point of view to the relationship to hidden worlds. Um, and that's not often achieved through the archaeological record, so there is some hope there. So for the perspective it offers on entwined immateriality in reality, uh, in its quick pace allowing the observation of human behavior on fast forward, basically, I think archaeology should keep a critical eye open and follow development in the emerging field the anthropology of internet is. Thank you.